If you're just joining, you're listening to Post Row Testing the Law. My name is Connor Goodwin, and I'm an events associate with ProPublica. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, the legal landscape has shifted rapidly, creating confusion among people seeking reproductive health care and medical providers. In this moment of uncertainty, ProPublica has convened a group of experts to survey the current landscape on abortion rights, dissect legal strategies at play on both sides, and answer your questions. If you'd like to submit a question at any point, you can do so by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing it there. We'll try to answer as many as we can, but if we don't get to yours, I encourage you to join our next post row event in early October. And now, allow me to introduce our speakers. Carlos Chapman is an associate professor of law at Washington and Lee University. Her scholarship on commercial litigation examines the interplay of business entities, government, and individuals. Kim Mutcherson is co-dean and professor of law at Rutgers Law School. Her award-winning scholarship focuses on reproductive justice, bioethics, health law, and family. Nicole Santa Cruz is a reporter for ProPublica's Southwest Unit, where she investigates how inequalities impact marginalized communities. And our moderator today is ProPublica senior editor, Ziva Branstetter. I'll let Ziva take it from here. Thanks so much, Connor. And um, <clears throat> thank you all for joining us. Um, we feel like this is a really important conversation to be having, and I'm just thrilled that uh, we have such an all-star panel to guide us through this. I want to set the table a little bit and, and ask the panel, you know, more than two months out from the overturning of Roe v. Wade, how have you, how have you all seen uh, abortion bans enforced in general? Are there any notable trends? Uh, what has uh, surprised you uh, as far as just sort of the fallout? So I'll, I'll, I'll start. And, um, you know, I would say that there's nothing particularly surprising about what has happened, right? The expectation of anybody who's been paying attention was there would be chaos. And that's 100% what we have seen. So um, on one hand, we have states that had trigger laws. And um, the question was, do they go into effect immediately? Or do, you know, some of them had lag times. So there were all of those questions that were being asked. Um, lots of questions about what these statutes actually mean, right? These are not statutes that were written um, by healthcare providers. They're written by people in state legislators, legislatures. Um, and so they use language that's not necessarily medical language. And so what we now have are lots of healthcare providers who, one, don't know what the law is, right, from day to day, in part because there's already lots of litigation going on. Um, but also, even if they read it, it doesn't necessarily make sense given the kind of work that they are doing. So we're absolutely seeing that. Um, clinic closures, which of course don't just mean people don't get access to abortion. Um, it also means people don't get access to birth control and plan B and all sorts of things. Um, and then I think what we're really, and obviously we've seen lots of issues with miscarriage management um, because of these, these new rules and how vague they are. Um, so, you know, I think that what we are looking at right now, um, no matter what some people, no matter what some state legislators might be saying right mm -hmm. now is 100% a hundred percent a feature and not a bug, right? The goal here was to create a, a set of circumstances where people who are abortion providers would not be able to provide abortions. And that's either because there's a ban or it's because the law is so vague um, that they don't know how they can practice medicine anymore. So we're in, a, we're in a really bad state if you care deeply about women and pregnant people and access to reproductive medicine. Fascinating. Um, thank you so much. And we did have a comment that <clears throat> there was a, a listener who wanted us to speak up. So I'm gonna try and do that. Uh, you are perfect. Um, Let's see, Nicole. I wanted you to summarize, if you can, the story that you had you had uh, written, uh, ProPublica. I'm sure uh, most of our hundreds of viewers here read it, um, but can you remind them what you what you uncovered and uh, what was so unusual about this case? Yeah, thanks, Eva. Um, basically, I found out about a lawsuit where a a woman who had ended an unwanted pregnancy with abortion pills that she obtained at a Phoenix 
clinic, um, she ended up involved in a lawsuit over that decision. Her ex-husband ended up suing the abortion clinic where she obtained the abortion. And um, he he filed a wrongful death lawsuit um, against that clinic, which is kind of a, um, it's it was a civil suit that's kind of seen as an enforcement mechanism to enforce um, anti-abortion laws. So the National Right to Life Committee has recently released uh, model legislation regarding um, ways to enforce abortion bans. So this is just kind of one sliver of the law that um, we could be seeing more of now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting um issue because it has all sorts of unintended consequences or maybe intended as you know some of you uh, can discuss later on. Um, Carlos, can you talk to us about this about the questions of personhood? You know what have you learned so far and where do you think things might be headed uh, related to this uh, issue? You know, I found fascinating about Nicole's Cole story and the case that she um, wrote about is that that is exactly where personhood bills go. Um, you in recognize Venus as a person, it would enable a father, um, including fathers who are abusers, to pursue the pregnant woman after the fact and to use the court system as a form of abuse. And, you know, in my opinion, that's just the beginning. Um, you know, what happens when a rapist wants to do the same thing? Um, what happens when, you know, a father wants to block a form of health care for the mother? Um, you know, there kind of is no limit to what happens when you are forcing a court or a doctor um, or any other medical provider to compare the personhood of a fetus to the mother instead of thinking about the best life, you know, the best interest of, of the person who is pregnant. Um, you know, there, there are tax and other implications to this. We have the example of the woman who tried to drive through the SUV lane because there were two people because she was pregnant or HOV lane because there are two people like pregnant. Um, we have the state of Georgia that has declared you can claim the fetus on your taxes as soon as you know you're pregnant because they have a personhood statute. Um, and I think there's kind of a limit to where this can go. Um, the questions I have are, are we allowed to have state by state definitions of personhood and how does that impact citizenship? How does it impact the census count? How does that impact the federal tax code and not just the state tax code? And I think these are things that people have not thought through. Um, I, I think the point of a personhood bill is to ban abortion, not to change immigration or not to change citizenship or to change the tax code. But those are the consequences, including you know, the horrible situation that Nicole wrote about in her, in her, in her uh, article. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that brings up such an interesting point about, you know, the people who are most affected by by this, uh, by overturning uh, Roe v. Wade and by these abortion bans. Uh, Kim and Carlos, could you both talk a little bit about who are the people in the communities most harshly impacted by abortion bans? And are there ways to protect those who are most vulnerable in a, in a world without Roe, uh, at, you know, especially in these states where the restrictions are so, so tight? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, one thing that we that we know um, is that uh, um, women of color, particularly black women, are overrepresented in the folks who get abortions in this country. Um, And so an abortion ban obviously is going to impact black women in a very distinct way because of that. Um, Abortion bans hurt younger women. They hurt women who live in rural areas. Um, They hurt women who, um, as Carlos was suggesting, women who are in abusive relationships who may want to terminate a pregnancy because having a child with your abuser links you to that person in a way that you might not want to. Um, So there are lots of folks who are particularly vulnerable who are not going to have access to abortion. Mm -hmm. Um, And one thing that I should say, just to be really fair, is that um, you know, Roe has been on a, on a, a death spiral for a very long time, and certainly since 1992, when the Supreme Court decided Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So there are lots of women um, in this country who have had very limited access um, to abortion services for a long time. And when you create a world that has the kind of patchwork that we're looking at right now, um, what it means is that 
if you have privilege, right, if you have the money that allows you to travel, um, if you don't have to worry about taking time off of work, if you don't have to worry about um, finding childcare, if you don't have to worry about driving 500 miles and paying for a hotel um, in order to have an abortion, you're going to be much more well positioned. My lights have decided I'm not moving enough. Um, you're going to be much more well positioned um, to actually be able to exercise a right to terminate a pregnancy than lots and lots of people will be. Um, and so it's really the women who are most vulnerable already who are hurt the most by banning abortion. Right. And I wanted to follow that up and um, talk a little bit about the ways that women uh, and people uh, who can become pregnant are affected and get into the weeds a little bit and uh, talk about uh, whether the consequences are intended or unintended, uh, the consequences. Um, you know, we've seen these anecdotal stories of, you know, people who did want to continue the pregnancy, but, you know, couldn't get care. So can you talk a little bit about the things that concern you most that, that are happening on the ground? So I think the big thing, obviously, is that because healthcare providers aren't sure what the rules are, they don't know how to proceed. Um, and I, you know, as much as I love lawyers, I'm a law professor, I'm a lawyer. Um, if I'm in a hospital because I need care for a miscarriage, I don't really want them calling a bunch of lawyers and saying, well, what should we do now, right? Well, somebody is, is, is bleeding, um, but if there's still a fetal heartbeat, you can't actually terminate that pregnancy. So um, depending upon where you are, of course, what jurisdiction you're in. So, you know, that that is a consequence that um, on one hand is potentially unintended, but I also think is a reflection of the fact that a lot of folks who wrote these laws um, seem to know very little about pregnancy and <laughs> seem to know very little um, about, you know, women's bodies, right? I mean, the number of women who um, miscarry very early um, in, in their pregnancies um, is probably a lot larger than a lot of these folks um, imagine or listening to people say things like um, an ectopic pregnancy doesn't require um, an abortion, which is just such a, um, such a, such a reflection of just biologically not understanding how any of this any of this works. So we have women who are suffering who should not be suffering. Um, we have healthcare providers who are probably worried not just about um, criminal liability, but also civil liability. So you think you're following the law, but then somebody ends up um, in a bad position and you get, get sued for that. The other thing that I think is really important to remember here is because we have all of these different statutes, the rules and the standards are different as well. So for instance, we have one state that says, um, even if you are, you are terminating a pregnancy because there's an exception that allows you to perform an abortion, um, you should do so in a way that is most likely to lead to the birth of a, uh, right. lead to a successful birth, which is a very strange position to take um, mm -hmm. here and potentially a position that actually creates more risk for the person um, who is pregnant. And that is obviously deeply, deeply um, problematic. So, um, you know, we, we're just in a place where we are, we are putting lots of folks at risk and we are requiring them to subject themselves to both physical and psychological um, harm um, because the laws don't, don't make any sense. And, and one more thing that I should say here, even the laws that do have exceptions, so they might have a life exception, um, one of the things about Roe and Casey was that it required not only an exception to save the life of the pregnant person, but also health. Um, health isn't in a lot of these statutes. So let's say that what your physician wants to do is preserve your fertility. That's not saving your life, right? But it's putting you in a position where you could later have um, potentially another child and the law isn't protecting that. Um, so we're, we're in a space where I think that we really have a lot of work to do. One, to make sure that legislators actually understand what they're doing um, when they pass these bills um, and also to make sure that people get the care that they are, that they are entitled to, frankly. Right. Um, so interesting. So Carlos, um, I wanted to um, have you weigh on this and then Kim as well, um, sort of looking ahead uh, to the future. You know, there are states uh, that are um, where they have clearly said that abortion is legal here. We want to provide that service, you know, within our own state laws. Uh, we want to allow people who can become pregnant to come here and, and receive those services. So how are you seeing these states preparing to deal with what could be an influx of patients uh, from states with bans? And, and how can these, how are these states expanding their capacity? Have you all seen any 
evidence of that. And then sort of related to that, um, the audience has a question about any basis in law uh, for a state prohibiting travel to another state for an abortion. Um, so whoever wants to take all that on, but basically abortion I'll, friendly states are getting ready. I'll take the travel question first. And um, just as Kavanaugh said, he felt like um, travel could not be banned. And I tend to agree it's unconstitutional to ban people to cross state lines. Um, but the problem would not be banned from crossing state lines. It would be the civil penalty for aiding someone to cross state lines that could end up being a de facto travel ban. I don't know that our current Supreme court or current civil courts would find those things unconstitutional. Um, and I feel like the Texas law has that too, where it's like, you know, if you aid someone in traveling across state lines, we're not gonna block that person. We're gonna block you for giving them a plane, plane ticket or providing an abortion fund. Um, I, you know, I've seen states that are providing abortions, ramp up services um, and plan for the influx, putting more planning for clinics on borders, for example. Um, you know, but the real problem is not every state that currently provides abortion or that thinks their approach state is even safe. safe. And I think about Michigan, for example, um, or Virginia. Like I'm in Virginia now and they're planning a special session starting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, specifically to, to debate a personhood bill and to ban abortion, whereas Virginia is the only kind of bright spot in a mass of, uh, of states that have total bans or, or almost near total bans. So, um, I, I, you know, the idea of safety and safe states to me is, is very tenuous. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just don't, I, I think that states definitely want to provide and want to be have their doors open, um, but I could see you know, these penalties being a problem. Um, the other thing I've, I've been thinking about though is the availability of uh, medica medical abortions by mail yes. and getting the prescription by, prescriptions by mail. Um, and I have been contemplating whether there's a federal preemption issue there um, because the FDA has defined that these, these medications are safe, that they can be shipped by telemedicine, um, they are prescribed for other uses. And we've, I've seen a lot of stories about women who are not getting like their medication for rheumatoid arthritis, other treatments because of fear that it could be an abortificant. And I think that you know, that kind of FDA battle may be a way that we can win some ground. Yes, it's very interesting because, you know, can states ban people from receiving things in the mail, you know, um, so it really sets up a federal state tension there that uh, is going to need to play out in the courts or be tested. Um, follow up question uh, from the audience. What if a pregnant person is visiting a state on business or a vacation and needs care? Like, I mean, again, what, what restrictions would exist there? <clears throat> I mean, I mean, if you're I, if you're in a state that bans, if you go for vacation in a state that bans abortion, and you find yourself needing um, an abortion, you you might be in trouble, right? I mean, so part of the um, part of the battle that's going on right now between the feds and the state um, is what does EMTALA mean? So EMTALA is a statute that was passed many years ago. Um, basically to keep hospitals from dumping patients, right? So you didn't want a patient to show up in an emergency and the hospital says, oh, wait, you don't have insurance. Let's go like put you on the street and then hope somebody else will deal with you. Um, and so the, you know, the federal government came out and said, listen, if somebody needs abortion care um, under EMTALA, then states are, or healthcare providers are required um, to provide that care. And of course, now we we've, we've have two different decisions from two different courts, federal courts already um, coming down on different sides of that issue, right? Whether the federal government can tell a state that your abortion ban um, cannot be, will not be enforced if it is in violation of EMTALA. Um, the worry, of course, is that once you have a circuit split, so, you know, Idaho says one thing, Texas says something else, or, you know, whoever, that that then winds its way back up to this mm -hmm. U.S. Supreme Court, um, which, frankly, I'm not particularly interested in seeing the U.S. Supreme Court decide any more abortion cases um, anytime in the near future. So, that's really going to be playing playing itself out. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to add, though, and I think this goes uh, to what Carlos was saying, particularly about medication abortion, 
Um, for a very, very long time, it was a sort of basic tenet of um, the anti-choice movement. You don't punish women, women, right? right? You don't punish the people who are getting abortions. You punish the people who are providing abortions. Um, and we live in such a different world now. On one hand, medication abortion is fantastic because it can be self-managed and it can be done safely. Um, and you can order the pills and they can come to your house. But because of that, I think one of the things that we are going to see is states saying, all right, we can't go after the doctors anymore, right? Because there are people who are performing their own abortions safely, right? Which you, again, very safe to do so with medication. Um, so we're going to just have to start punishing those, those women. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to punish them by doing things like if you show up at the hospital and they think that you've used abortion pills, right? Then some, you know, a nurse or a doctor says, well, I guess I should call the police because I think you may have had um, an illegal abortion. You know, so the consequences there are, are, are really significant potentially. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm really concerned about that the, the criminalization of pregnancy um, is simply going to expand. And we know in this country that when pregnancy gets criminalized that that burden falls most on women of color and poor women. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, I, you know, speaking of that, what the federal government ha has done, can do, uh, EMTALA is one one thing that they that the federal government has tried to invoke. Um, has the response from the federal government been adequate? There were a lot of criticism early um, after Roe v. Wade was ever turned to the <clears throat> other Biden administration. Uh, you know, not doing enough. Um, there have been some speeches, but like doesn't seem like a lot of action. Their options are fairly limited. So what have the feds done to help and what the federal government done to help and what more do you all, our experts, think that the federal government should be doing? <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can start on that one. Um, you know, I think, you know, the federal preemption issue and the fact that the federal has, federal government has land is something that has not been exploited enough, right? Mm -hmm. The federal government has hospitals. The federal government has lands that are federal lands. Um, and I do not understand why we are not pushing state laws and performing abortions in states where there are bans on federal property and putting the federal sovereignty issue. Um, and, and that's just one thing that I think could be happening um, that I don't quite understand. And I, I guess, you know, the counter argument to that is, the high well, in a lot of states they're civil, uh, and there's civil penalties for the doctors, right? Yeah. So, you know, if, if a state has a civil penalty for a doctor performing an abortion period, um, are you just putting a doctor and their license at risk? But I know abortion providers personally who would be willing to take that risk and be the test case. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it doesn't it doesn't take many, right? It, it only takes a couple of places um, mm -hmm. to force this issue. It's very interesting. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm based here in Oklahoma, and uh, there there has been some discussion about native land, and and could you know you can't use federal funds, but could you use private funds? And on a, and there has been some reporting around this, um, so it's complicated. But the tribes, you know, don't want to to really wait, are not eager to wait into that. Is is what uh, my reading of this is. Um, so we have an audience question: Do we anticipate more federal challenges uh, like we saw in in Idaho? And if if you guys don't want to weigh in on this, just let me know. But um, our oh, this is, I mean, we're going to be litigating. The, the idea that what the Supreme Court did was sort of take abortion off the table as an issue <laughs> is just laughable. Um, right. We're going to be litigating all so many issues going forward, whether it's the preemption issue with federal versus state, um, whether it's trying to get clarity on what some of these laws are actually demanding, um, whether it's making decisions about whether a state can actually um, declare an embryo to be a person and what that means and how it plays itself out. Um, you know, the, the big winners here are lawyers, frankly, um, because we're going to have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, Nicole's story pointed this out, that there are issues involving, you know, who can decide, uh, you know, uh, fathers, rapists, people who are sort of now think they have a stake in, in deciding um, the fate of, you know, a woman's pregnancy. Um, so it's very interesting to see all of these legal issues coming up and, and, and sort of multiplying. Um, so Carlos, uh, a lot of people talked about the notion of forced birth. And, you know, if 
uh, one of the questions that come up is compensation. You know, if women essentially are are um, have no choice and they they want to end their pregnancy but can't and um, are essentially forced by the state to give birth, if you accept that as a, you know, that that is what's happening, uh, how should they or should they be compensated? We've been looking into this and, you know, if the state wants to build a highway past your house and tear it down, they have to compensate you under something we call takings, right? They have to give you just compensation for your, for the, for the taking of your property. Um, you know, if the state is forcing you to carry a child to term and to raise it, they should be compensating you for the taking of your body. Um, and you know, the question is how much and, and like, what is just, and where does it end in my, my opinion? Um, you know, you would at least think, you know, the, the medical expenses, the lost work, um, the cost of childbirth, um, the wear and tear on your body, you know, I'm 43. And if someone forced me to carry a child, I didn't want, I mean, wow. it literally kill, it could kill me. Right. Like it really could. Um, and how do you compensate for that? <laughs> Um, and then if you successfully carry a child to term and I am raising a child um, I did not intend to have, you know, a recent Wall Street Journal article said it is $300,000 on average to raise a child from mm -hmm. zero to 18. And we are imposing a $300,000 burden on pregnant persons every time we force them to carry a child to term and, and bring that life into the world. Um, so I think it needs to be compensated. I, you know, I personally think an abortion ban have a fiscal note. That is, here's the cost of health care. Here's the cost of replacing lost wages. We know that women earn less over their lifetime simply because they give birth and when they give birth. Um, mm -hmm. How do we make up for that wage gap for the rest of your life if you are, are forced to carry a child to term? We, we did have a reader uh, question, a viewer question about abortion pills and uh, do they just prevent pregnancy or, or what are they actually doing? And just for those out there that there, it's actually two, uh, medication abortion is, is two, two drugs. Um, one blocks the action of progesterone, which is essential to maintain pregnancy. And then there's a second drug that has to be taken within 48 hours to uh, complete the expulsion of the fertilized egg. So just want to you know deliver those facts can i, I, think can I add something there though because i think this is actually a really important point um one of the other things that we're going to watch happen is mm -hmm. that folks who are anti-abortion are also sort of redefining what is an abortion right um so yes medication abortion is an abortion right it is it is keeping you from it is terminating um a pregnancy plan b which is contraception, um, technically keeps you from becoming pregnant. Um, and yet we've already seen, so there was a case many years ago, um, the Hobby Lobby case that was decided and it was about the Affordable Care Act and um, whether employers could be um, required to provide birth control. Um, and one of the things that Hobby Lobby said was, well, we don't wanna even allow people to get plan B. We don't even wanna allow people to get morning after pills um, because as far as we're concerned, anything that has the potential of keeping a fertilized egg from implanting is an abortion. Right. So if we're gonna then start expanding what it means for there to be an abortion, then you need to start being worried about your contraception. Um, you know, you need to start being worried about a lot of things that normally we would have said, this is totally irrelevant in this context. So, you know, the Pandora's box that has been opened here is, is much more substantial than just, can I terminate a pregnancy or not terminate a pregnancy? Great point. Yeah. Um, go ahead. So want to jump in on that? And I wanted to build on I wanted to build on Kim's point in that, you know, when the concern about the loss of certain birth control is not just because of the loss of privacy, it is because of how we are interpreting abortion. So there are two ways in which birth control can fall. First, simply because Roe has fallen. And then if we don't extend the falling of Roe to be overturning other cases that dealt with, with birth control, it's the points that Kim made. So I think it's important to um, understand that the implications of this decision are, are very, very broad, vast. Right. And I just want to assure the audience, we are uh, getting to the Q&A portion where we're going to be addressing um, many more questions from you. Um, uh, so let's see. I think it's important to know that this is sort of the beginning and not 
the end, like we're just starting down a path. Um, and so I wondered if you all uh, had any, not, not predictions, but concerns or thoughts about big themes that are going to be developing in the next year, two, three, if, if, if you know, barring any major change in, in this ruling. Um, I, you know, I think that there are a lot of um, surprises to come, frankly, <laughs> um, for people. I mean, one is what Carlos was already alluding to, which is, you know, that, um, um, you know, they were, Justice Alito was very careful in the opinion here to say, you know, this is just about abortion. It's just, it's really not about anything else. Don't worry about anything else. And yet the entire way the argument is constructed in the majority opinion is essentially, uh, you know, the, that the constitution doesn't protect a right to privacy because the word privacy doesn't appear um, in the constitution. Well, neither does woman, neither does baby, neither does, you know, a whole lot of things um, mm -hmm. don't appear in the constitution, but, you know, our right to access abortion, our right to make um, decisions about our children and medical right. care, um, our right to marry who we want to marry, our right to have sex with who we want to have sex with, all of those are constitutionally protected because of privacy, right? So one of the things that I think we really need to keep an eye on is sort of what are the next dominoes to fall? Um, because as you say, Roe was a beginning. Roe Ro was not an end. It was an opportunity to um, one, uh, engage in a decades long campaign to build a Supreme Court that is now a very conservative um, Supreme Court. And so there are so many issues that are gonna come before that court where the impact will be much broader than, um, you know, whether you stay pregnant or, or decide to terminate a pregnancy. Right. Um, wanted to talk about some more legal questions. Uh, Carlos, are there any cases working their way through the courts uh, that could end up at the Supreme Court that would give the justices uh, the opportunity to declare that a fetus to be a person with constitutional rights or any other cases that are sort of precedent setting in your mind, potentially? Or so I've only been... I've only been focused on the personhood cases. And so far we don't have a specific case that I think would declare a fetus as a person, but I wanna reiterate what Kim said earlier about this current Supreme Court. It doesn't mean that they don't, don't do that kind of as dicta to another case. So, you know, most of the personhood bills that are out there have not been challenged on personhood grounds. They've been challenged on other grounds. Um, and, and we have seen the court before just rule on an issue that isn't in briefing or rule on an issue that is a part of a bill. Um, so I don't want to say no outright. I want a qualified law professor answer of um, there aren't any directly, but that doesn't mean that one won't make it to the Supreme Court and you won't have fetuses declared a person. Okay, great. Um, Kim, one of Roe's weaknesses was the standard of viability, which can change over time as relevant sciences advance. So Roe, in other words, inflicted um, an unpredictable standard on people, uh, uh, some would say. Um, so should future abortion rights, whether statutory or otherwise, avoid the language of viability in, in, your, in your mind? Uh, and if so, what do we replace that with? Well, that's, that, that's an easy question. Um, so really it was Planned Parenthood versus Casey that really drilled down on viability, right? Because Roe gave us the three trimesters um, and was much more protective of abortion rights um, than Planned Parenthood and viability. Um, and one of the longstanding critiques of Planned Parenthood versus Casey um, was viability is, is a shifting line, right? Um, for, for the better, it is a shifting line because science and medicine um, improve. So I think that we're all, we were always going to be in trouble if we were focused on the question of viability, um, as opposed to being focused on the question of equality, of bodily integrity, um, of medical decision making, um, and of privacy. Um, and so because we went in a particular direction, I think that sort of allowed us to kind of fall off a cliff. Um, whereas, and there's lots of, you know, people who've written about this, there were, um, 
amicus briefs in 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 the uh, in the Dobbs case um, about the idea that really what the the conversation that we should be having when it comes to abortion and abortion rights is a conversation about equality and particularly sex equality um, as opposed to having this conversation about you know what is a fetus and what is it a person um, et cetera et cetera because at the at the end of the day whatever you think um, uh, about what a fetus is or isn't, um, no, no one else in this country um, is told, we're gonna take away rights to your body in order to benefit somebody else, right? So if, if I'm a parent and I have a child who needs a kidney and I'm a perfect match, um, the state can't force me to give up my kidney. The state can't force me to even give blood um, to my kid. Um, mm -hmm. And yet in this context, we're willing to say, but you're in this context, your body is something that we can conscript, conscript um, for state purposes. Um, another, uh, these are all reader questions at this point. I mean, the viewer questions at this point. Um, so another really interesting, you talked about the Hobby Lobby case and, and uh, this is a, sort of an outgrowth of that. What about the approach of demanding religious freedom to obtain an abortion? Some religious groups include as a tenant uh, that life does not begin until birth. And uh, the Supreme Court seems tilted pretty dramatically toward religious freedom. So it seems like a, an interesting um, way to turn that um, philosophy on its head. What are the chances of such claims prevailing? Probably not good. Do either of you have an opinion? I, 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 can, I can start on that one. I think that um, when we, we have to acknowledge that when we say religious freedom in this country, we tend to mean one religion in one religious perspective. Um, and I think that those challenges will just reinforce that. Um, I, I think that, you know, it, it's it's like, well, we're only going to honor the religion that preserves life, not the one that doesn't, or some kind of other workaround uh, to get around it. But even the way the Hobby Lobby decision is written, in my opinion, you know, it's a, I view that as a corporate personhood decision. It's about, you know, whether a company should be. Um, able to make their employees or ban their employees from having access to certain health care. And we look at the religion of the founders and the, like, it, it, it's our, it's, it's bad law. And it's a bad, it's bad business law to start mm -hmm. with, but we use religion to make bad business law. Um, and I think it just doesn't stop there, right? It, like, we will make more bad law in the name of protecting one religion, not all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was interested in, uh, in Nicole and on your perspective, the story that you wrote, is that um, an isolated case or are you seeing more cases like that uh, or is it too early to tell? Um, At this point, it's an isolated case. Um, and as far as I know, we haven't seen anything else like it, um, but I think it's still too early to tell kind of how much this is going to catch on and mm -hmm. um, sort of the the civil actions that people will start taking so. mm -hmm. right and um before this concludes uh, uh connor if you can uh, drop a, a just a the general tip pro public a tip line in the in the chat for people who uh if you have story suggestions or questions or information that you think that our reporters who are working on this issue nicole and others need to know please uh please reach out to us um let's see uh, one of the questions that the viewers had is where do things stand with accepting, we've talked about this some, but with ac accessing the um, abortion medication online, there are, I know, European groups there. I saw a story about people in Mexico, they're sort of offshore um, operations that are trying to, you know, provide uh, people who are pregnant with this medication. So where do things stand with the access to those medications? I mean, it's they're, these are legal drugs, right? I yeah. mean, they're pills that are sold legally and they're sold not just for abortion purposes, but for other purposes um, mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, states are, um, states that want to ban abortion are obviously trying to figure out how wide a net can we cast. So whether it, as Carlos was saying, you know, before, whether it's about, um, you know, 
uh, punishing somebody, um, not saying you can't travel, but punishing you when you come back from traveling. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things that states are going to start trying to do. And it creates another opportunity for the federal government to step in and say, you know, you're overstepping your bounds here. Um, so that's that is another piece of litigation that I I expect that we will see. Um, the other thing to say about medication abortion, though, is that it's 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 hard to know, right? I mean, that's the reason why where we are now is really different from where we were before Roe versus Wade. Um, you know, unless unless you show up at a hospital um, and somebody gets you to admit that you actually took uh, abortion pills, it's going to be pretty hard to target people. Um, and I say that not as a way to say to people, you can get around, you know, the laws right. in your particular state, um, but just to say that, it's pretty easy in some cases to get around the laws um, mm -hmm. in, in your particular state. So we'll see how that plays itself out. And it goes back to what I said before um, about states starting to punish women as opposed to um, punish providers. We have some um, questions from healthcare providers who are uh, listening today. Um, one of them asks, uh, says, I work in the meetings and hospitality industry. Uh, we're trying to understand the implications in trigger law states for a pregnant person from another state seeking emergency treatment, aside from being turned away, what legal issues uh, might they face? I think one of you touched on this earlier. The laws of that state prevail, right? If you're in Louisiana or Mississippi or Oklahoma, like that's that's the law you're operating on. So how fast can you get home? Right. <laughs> Um, what is the obligation of doctors, this is a healthcare provider asking, the obligation of doctors to treat their patients according to standards of care, despite their own legal jeopardy? So I do bioethics as well. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that the real the real question here, and, and like Carlos, I know a number of people um, who are abortion providers, um, and these are folks who are deeply committed to the work that they do. And they recognize how important it is for the patients for whom they are providing um, abortion care. Um, and so there are definitely those who will say, my obligation to my patient has to prevail over you know, whatever this particular rule is, particularly rules that are vague. And a number of these statutes are quite vague um, in, in the ways that they, that they are articulated. So I think we will definitely definitely see healthcare providers who say, I have professional obligations and I will meet those professional obligations and I will take the consequences that flow from that. And there are others who will say, I'm not willing to lose my license to practice medicine, which I think is 100% understandable. Mm -hmm. um, people who say, I'm not willing to lose my freedom, right? I'm not gonna go to prison. Um, again, 100% understandable. Um, but the folks who I know who do this work are so deeply committed to it and see it not just as a professional act, but also as um, about um, equality and about compassion. Um, and so I think a lot of them are going to be willing to put themselves at risk in order to provide the care that's appropriate care for their patients. And I want to add something to that point. I think um, the risk is not really for women women who are seeing abortions, as we've seen um, in all the press stories about women who are having miscarriages. Um, the risk is for a woman who has an, a wanted pregnancy, right. an intended pregnancy, and is in a medical emergency, because it's that those doctors in the hospital who don't view themselves as abortion providers, who seem to be making the difficult ethical decisions. And in a hospital setting, they may not have a choice. They may not be able to, pro to provide the care until some higher up authorizes it. Yeah, I think there's a, a false narrative that uh, there's two two situations here. A woman that wants to get rid of a pregnancy, a woman wants to keep it. There's all kinds of situations in the middle where people want to continue pregnancies, have an illness, fetal abnormality. There, there's a lot of complications involved here. Um, this may be too new, uh, Carlos, for you to address, but there's a, a viewer that asks about today's Braidwood decision out of Texas. Um, and how does that inform the discussion? Could we see companies who do not want to insure women who previously had abortions on religious grounds? Do you want to weigh in on that? Or do you know anything about it? I have not read that case because I okay. also do uh, corporate law and I do Elon today. Musk. So I've been doing yeah. that today. We will be following, our reporters here at ProPublica are, are keeping abreast of these developments and trying to um, make sure that uh, the big themes that are coming out of this, uh, in this landscape, that we're addressing those in our in our coverage. 
Um, you know, what about providers? Uh, one of our medical uh, healthcare providers asked, what about providers who have privileges in multiple states? Uh, meaning if I provide uh, legal abortion care services in my state, but also provide non-abortion services in, in a neighboring state where abortion is illegal, uh, I, this person could be at risk for losing their license, I guess, in that neighboring state, right? So there are a lot of, I mean, I'll start by saying this. I am providing no legal advice to people right. who are performing abortions. That's on your um, expertise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there are, you know, there are a lot of questions that are going to have to be sorted out, right? So the 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 most um sensible answer would be if you're providing abortions in a state where it's legal to provide abortions and then you're also providing non-abortion related care um, elsewhere, you should be fine. The problem, of course, um, is what Carlos was talking about earlier, which is some of these statutes um, are do seek to sort of cross borders. Um, and the question will be, you know, is there any way for a state to enforce their ban against a physician who shows up in their state because that person is, is providing abortions elsewhere? And so one of the things, that anytime I get a chance to, to, to tout um, the joys of living in New Jersey, which is where I happen to live, people can make their jokes if they want to. Um, but you know, New Jersey uh, passed a Reproductive Freedom Act not too long ago. Um, and then after Dobbs fell, New Jersey also, we've already sort of taken steps to protect specifically providers so and patients who might come here um, for abortion. So, you know, if we get a subpoena where you're not going to send anybody's medical records, you know, those sorts of things. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really a really important thing that pro that pro um, pro abortion and pro choice states can do um, to protect healthcare providers and patients. <clears throat> right. Um... Let's see, we have a viewer asking about the North Platte, uh, Nebraska case where the mother and daughter were punished uh, based on the Facebook messages and securing an abortion and just uh, not necessarily just that case, but what are the implications here for digital privacy? Um, you have, you know, the period trackers and things like that. Um, talk a little bit about that landscape. I mean, I've been letting, I've been reminding people that all electronic communication is trackable. And so just because you're not seeing a text message, if you're sending a Facebook DM, a Twitter DM, a message on Instagram, I mean, I guess we consider Signal to be secure. Like that's how I message people in the press usually or people who work in the administration. Um, but, you know, the, the problem with electronics is it creates a trail. Um, you know, and I know a lot of stuff went around about, hey, everyone, let's confuse our period trackers so that like they can't, you know, figure things out. But you know, I, I think the only thing that's safe is old school communication. You know, if, if you're planning an abortion, maybe pick up the phone and don't send a text. Um, if, um, you know, maybe don't use that period tracker and maybe just use an old school calendar and go back to what you used to do. Um, because everything electronic is keeping a record and it just depends on whether the company is going to respond to subpoenas or not. Mm -hmm. By the way, we do have um, on, on ProPublica's website uh, ways to contact us securely, and we, we do take that security very seriously for people who want to provide us information on any topic. Um, uh, Kim or Carlos or both of you, you know, Tennessee has a law that includes language about how the mental health of the pregnant person, if they are threatening suicide, does not count as a threat to the life of the pregnant person. Have you seen language like that elsewhere? I haven't seen language like that necessarily elsewhere, but it is certainly the case that other states do not have health exceptions at all, um, that the only exception um, is a life exception. Um, and so that's leaving out all sorts of things, right? It's not just, it's leaving out obviously um, psychological harm, it's leaving out um, mental health issues, it's leaving out, for instance, somebody who, um, you know, let, let's imagine that you get diagnosed with cancer during your pregnancy and you could wait and then you could start cancer treatment after you're not pregnant anymore, but that potentially reduces your ability to, to be cured, right? So, you know, there are a lot of different um, sets of circumstances short of death um, where states are saying, well, then that, that's just not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as much as I can 
criticize Roe and Casey, and both of them were worthy of deep, deep criticism, um, the one thing that the court kept coming back to was one, you have a constitutional right to an abortion, um, and two, even in those cases when a state can ban abortion, they have to have an exception for life, and they have to have an exception um, for health, um, and that simply doesn't, isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. And mental health is health, you know, I mean, that I think that that is uh, forgotten. Um, what about the enforcement of, of these laws? There was, uh, I think, 80 district attorneys, mainly uh, uh, urban counties, uh, who uh, penned a letter saying we're not going to enforce these. Prosecution uh, is, a, is a decision that prosecutors make. They don't file every case that comes to them. They decide what they want, what their priorities are. Do you do you think there'll be a substantial amount of uh, district attorneys who uh, refuse to prosecute, especially when, uh, people who can become pregnant? <clears throat> I, I think so, but I think that's why next frontier is these civil actions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm from Texas originally, and and I, I know that in Harris County, Dallas County, Austin County, you know, the liberal places, I don't see those DAs. Mm -hmm. prosecuting abortion providers, but I do see people filing lawsuits against people who, who are having abortions. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's the problem as well. And then when it comes to abortion providers in hospitals, you know, they can be bankrupted by litigation, even if it's wrongful. Um, so the mere existence of these civil actions can act as a de facto ban, even if there isn't a total ban. Mm -hmm. And I think I want to really follow up on that because I think it's such an important point here. The fact of the matter is, is we're not seeing, you know, huge amounts of enforcement of these bans because they right. don't have to, right? That the, that the, that some of the power, a significant part of the power is that people don't know what they can do or people don't know what's going to be prosecuted. Um, and in that set of circumstances, people are being enormously cautious. Um, and so, you know, it's not even necessarily, right? There, we're not seeing any states doing huge sweeps, right? Um, and catching people because they don't have to. They just have to create enough fear that people won't provide the care anymore. Um, and then on the point of, you know, district attorneys, there are a few things. So one is, is, um, nobody wants to count on their DA being one who's not going to prosecute, right? And you're just sort of crossing your fingers and hoping that you're in the right in the right place. Um, two, we've already seen at least one governor say, "I will remove you from your post because you have said yes. um, that you're not going to be willing to prosecute these cases." Um, and then three, lots of DAs, you know, they're elected. So they're not just, they have to be thinking about what are the consequences if I'm, ref if I'm saying I'm going to refuse to do these kinds of prosecutions um, when I go back up for re-election again. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that folks have to think about here um, in terms of whether, the, whether and how the criminal justice system is going to be used against both pregnant mm -hmm. people and people who provide abortions. Mm -hmm. Um, great. I'm going to uh, pose two more questions and then we're going to uh, wrap it up because we are getting uh, to the end of our hour and it's flown by. It's just been such a fascinating discussion. Um, I wanted to ask you guys to, if you can, uh, summarize the most impactful legal strategies to date uh, by states outlaw uh, on outlawing abortion. Like, I don't, I don't want to say successful, but what, you know, of the legal strategies to date, restricting abortions, which have had sort of the greatest impact? I mean, the greatest legal strategy is a ban, right? Um, right. The greatest legal strategy um, right now um, is a ban. And then we're, what we're going to start to see is um, what, what amount of ban is okay. Right. So, you know, we're going to see people saying, okay, if a ban doesn't have a life exception, then it's got to be, then it's got to fall. If a ban doesn't have um, a health exception, then it's got to fall, right? So we're going to see this sort of um, process of trying to make sense of exactly how far um, can states go. And, you know, I'll, I'll, one of the other things that I'll say is that um, what, what we also got in Planned Parenthood versus Casey was um, that states could not require um, a husband's consent for a married woman um, to terminate a pregnancy. That's no longer the law of the land, right? So let's see what states do with that. Um, so I think that you know the the most the 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 most drastic thing that a state can do is say you cannot do abortion, um, you cannot do abortions in any set of circumstances um, in this state, and then it's all going to be about sort of building back to figure out where where are the real limits um, to what states can do. Mm -hmm. And 
Can I just add, um, you know, the second best strategy to an outright ban is the chaos and confusion. And, and we were experiencing it pre-Dobbs when, you know, there would be an abortion ban and then it would get stayed and people were not um, sure whether they could get an abortion or not. And so, you know, abortion clinics would not have anyone coming because people weren't even sure even when abortion was legal. And you kind of have seen that in states like Texas where it's like, it stayed now, it's, oh wait, it's back on. It stayed now, it's back on. Um, that is as effective as an outright ban. Yeah. It's because a feature people, of people believe, yeah. Right, interesting. Um, so I've got uh, one more quick question and then we're gonna wrap it up with some resources to leave our audience with. Um, do you all, what do you all see for, uh, the feature of contraception. There have been many uh, people concerned that we've got a slippery slope, that uh, uh, contraception is sort of the next thing that um, uh, abortion opponents will turn to, to try to restrict, outlaw, remove. Do you all see that happening? Yes. Yeah. It's all, I mean, it's all a part of the plan, right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's really important to keep in mind um, that, that, the, that the folks who are pushing hardest, who were pushing hardest um, for overturning Roe, that's just a small sliver of an agenda. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of other things and there, this opens the door um, to a lot of those other ways of controlling people's sexuality, of controlling how people and with whom people procreate, of controlling who people marry. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of space that has been opened now. And there's a, I think there's a sense among um, lots of folks on the right that um, we've got momentum, mm -hmm. right? And that now is the time to really move forward with some of these things that might've seemed really extreme even just a few months ago. And of course, uh, yeah. uh, outside of the issue of whether uh, these folks think contraception is okay or a moral issue, it, it can also be used in some cases uh, to to uh, after the fact, like Plan B. Um, so that's you know, um, so I want to leave uh, our our viewers with some good sources of accurate information uh, that the public can turn to in order to understand the laws in their state, as well as how overturning Roe v. Wade is impacting their state. You guys have any like what are your top picks, top recommendations? Well, I think Kim and I both recommend Gut Monster Institute. Um, it, like, it is the most accurate up to date 50 state surveys of information. Um, and that's usually my first source that I go to. Um, but I will also say, um, you know, most of the general press seems to be accurate, right? I, I think that the, the press is doing a good job of reporting on this. I'm, I'm not seeing much misinformation from like mainstream media sources. So, you know, if you want statistics and data, a gut mocker, but um, just keep paying attention to the news on this. Truly. Right. right. It is, it has been a very difficult thing I can say for many in the media to cover because it's playing out in this very um, piecemeal patchwork way. I, I wonder, for example, have, have women died? Have there been any, any mm -hmm. actual so people who have not received uh, you know, uh, immediate medical attention when needed. Um, I don't think we really have a good way of getting our arms around the actual, uh, the actual uh, human harm here. But can, I, can, I, can I add one thing to that though, which I think is really important. Um, you know, this country has the highest maternal mortality rate of any developed nation. And for black women, the risk of dying during or after pregnancy is anywhere from two to five times higher than it is for white women. So we're gonna see women dying and we're gonna see women dying at a higher rate because they will be forced to carry pregnancies to term in a country that does not care about keeping pregnant women and new mothers alive. And yeah. that's just the truth, right? So abortion ban aside, um, this country has not cared enough about women to keep them alive. Um, and this is simply going to increase the number of women who die um, in childbirth or immediately after childbirth. Such a great point. We have a, a, an amazing 2017 um, maternal mortality project called Lost Mothers. And um, uh, Cameron, if you can, uh, Connor, if you can um, drop that link in the chat for people, um, it really explored that whole issue, which is definitely related to this discussion today. Um, so yeah, that was uh, Nina Martin and, and a lot of other folks from ProPublica put that together, a lot, lot of work and really told the story of, of who's um, paying the price for that issue in America. 